All right. Hey, Pernosses. Welcome back. We've got an awesome episode coming up as usual. Do I say that every week? Because we do have another great one. We've got the founder of automations.io coming up. He's built some crazy cool custom automations into Printavo that a lot of shops are using. Some advanced automations though. So we'll get into some of those examples and share those. And actually you can sign up too after the episode. The other thing that we talk about is um, Apple Vision Pros. I want someone to buy them so I could try them once and uh, and then be able to put them back down probably. But there's some interesting use cases. And, and I feel like some people definitely in the space should invest in, in, in seeing how applicable they could be to help people in a shop or the owners of shops. Well, Bruce, I think you're going to be the first one to buy it. I can see it coming. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's the box is going to come and I made a picture, but uh, no, super awesome episode with Alex. Um, what's interesting about automations.io is it's different from Zapier in that they'll build for you. And so Matt Marcotte and I and several other people in the industry have gotten to know Alex pretty well. I've given him some pretty hard za- like tasks to build, one of them being like a HubSpot integration, chasing sequences. And he kind of talks through um, how he does that for customers, how you can get involved. He's an early company, um, which is cool. And you're going you're gonna to learn about the reason he does things a certain way at an early stage of the business. Bruce, I thought it was really interesting to hear your story of your first customers, too. Um, and what you charged early on. Uh, so super awesome episode. But before that, uh, we've got some sponsors. All right, <clears throat> everybody. I need you to open up your phone, slide open, type in your passcode of 0000 and go to Instagram. Type in multicraft underscore daddy and send him a message. Multicraft daddy is sending out PMI tape every single week to one lucky winner for you to be able to try or continue using. Uh, Multicraft screen printing and digital supplies for over 50 years have been providing the industry with top brands at competitive pricing. And if you mentioned the Printava pod, you also receive 10% off your first order. Thanks, Multicraft. Bruce, you shouldn't spend all day cleaning dirty screens. Easyway's line of environmentally conscious chemicals will get the job done faster, more efficiently, and cost you a fraction of the cost per screen. At Campus Inc., we use 701 and 842. Those are our favorite chemicals. And if you value a company to help you with the how-tos, the best practices, and the questions, give Easyway a try. They're the easiest way. Uh, they just went through a cool rebrand, and i um, really excited about the things that they are cooking up. So thanks so much, Easyway. Super Color. Super Color is the world's best heat transfers made by screen printers for screen printers. Uh, it's like the FUBU for heat transfers. <laughs> they understand the pressures and expectations of a screen printing business. And so that's why they pride ourselves on being super fast and super easy. Um, their support is awesome. I mean, I, I definitely emailed them a few times with issues. They respond super quick and have really dialed it in and or even ship stuff overnight if needed. So thank you, Supercolor. Um, not only that, but if you mention Printavo 1.5, that gets you 15% off your order. Also, Supercolor's got some new stuff. DTF is here. So their quantities are lower. You can go to Super DTF and give it a try. All right. Last but not least, Graphic Source. If you need a solution to help improve efficiency and reduce costs in your art department, 1-900-HOTSTUFF.COM, aka Graphx Source, is there to be able to help. Mention Printavo Pod 2.4. That gets you 50% off your first vector, SAP, or digitized order. That's Printavo Pod 2.4. Campus Inc. has, drumroll please, how many artists at Graphx Source? Five? You have one hand? Five. He's got five artists. Five. That's pretty cool. Uh, but that's back office, not just art. They're doing order entry. They're in Shopify. They're building online stores. We love our graphic source team. Graphic source. They're cranking for Campus Inc. And they can crank for you too. TM. Trademark that. Sorry, guys. All right, guys. Let's jump on in the episode. Where, uh, Alex, where are you calling from? I'm in Manchester, UK. In the UK. So what time oh, was it? What five, six, four p.m.? What, what we uh, four p.m. Four p.m. All and right. So it's we're Chicago and L.A. So um, mm-hmm. 
West Coast Central Time. It's we're, we're we're global. This is a global podcast. Alex, uh, we've started to work together just a little bit. Um, you're the founder of Automations.io. You have kind of started to niche into the printing industry, and automations are a hot topic in our space. Shops using Printavo know very much about Zapier or don't know anything about Zapier. But I think the angle that you have taken and the approach is different. And I uh, wanted to come and talk about automations. And did you guys you know, meet? I don't. How, did Mark had introduce us? Yes, I think so. I got, I got introduced to Matt Marcotte, and I think he introduced uh, us. How did you find Matt? Um, we've got a mutual uh, friend, colleague. Uh, well, it's that I don't know what uh, how to call it. Uh, that person, Matt, to him is his brother-in-law. So I don't know oh, who that person okay. is to Matt. Well, yeah. I think what's interesting is is Matt works with hundreds and thousands of shops, uh, helping them set up their Printavo. Uh, Matt recently launched Screen Printing GPT, um, and so you you found the right guy. <laughs> yeah, and we, um, we keep him happy as well. Let's just kind of jump into it. Automations.io. I mean, I think the uh, I, I pulled up this web page on the Printable page because I haven't seen this in a while on automations.io and the headline is supercharged Printable with new features um, popular use cases quote and art approval chasing collect customer reviews remark it to past customers track daily sales summary record sales commissions <laughs> these are all the winning use cases that I think we could ask about to, to build functionality in um and uh, yeah, so that that's the preface of all of this. Yeah, yeah, um, and, and and I want to say I think um, so. When I usually explain what I do, I say I uh, we help companies automate manual repetitive work. Uh, but I think in this case, I need to clarify that it's digital work, not manual labor, because you're in printing industry. So we're not automating any. We're not building robots. We do digital robots, pretty much. That's how we automate. Alex, how is this different than Zapier? We're similar to Zapier. Uh, we can solve similar problems, but we, uh, we've taken a slightly different angle. So whereas with Zapier, you need to learn the tool, uh, you need to learn a bit of tech. Uh, so what we do is we build, we build automations for customers. So they come to us and say, okay, I need this, this, and that. We tell them, yes, we can do that, or we can't. Uh, most of the time we can, and we just set it up for them and they don't need to learn a new tool, spend time fixing it if it doesn't work and things like that. And um, if something breaks, uh, they drop us an email. We also get notified if our customers' automations break. So we're we'll proactive to jump in and see what's going on, what's wrong. So if Zapier is, uh, we're going to give you a steak and you have to cook it, automations.io is, uh, we're, we're going to cook the steak for you. Exactly. Yeah. And... I think for also for business owners, um, you need to pick the battles you want to fight. Um, so I, I think it's better for them to focus on more important things than potentially maybe learning a new tool, uh, setting everything up, uh, whereas we've done it hundreds of times. So we'll come in, we'll bid it much quicker and make sure it works exactly how they want. That's pretty cool, right? Because I hear... A lot of people, it, it is hard to learn how to do Zapier and use it, especially if you haven't done your first one. Like building out the first app is a little bit tricky. And it's like, what, what is this? What is that? What is this action and triggers and all this stuff? So people literally, and I'm not kind of baiting this question. <laughs> I just haven't gone through this workflow, but people just ask or or they fill out a form or type stuff. Or what is the flow for a shop to use Automations IO and then you build it? So we usually start with the discovery call, um, jump on a video call, hence my setup we talked about before. And uh, basically want to learn what they want to automate. So what are the manual things they do? Um, I think one of the most common things we do for print tower shops is art and code approval chasing. So as I understand, code goes out or art approval goes out. Um, customers take their time to approve it or reject it. And people have to manually chase for um, uh, to get to get um, to, would, to get it either approved or rejected. So we would build just a simple automation saying, "How often do you want automated emails to go out?" And they'll say something, um, 
let's send an email every three days uh, for two weeks. And if they don't approve it, we'll just archive it. Um, and then... So that's a flow. Oh, so that's no, a real example of a flow that you can build. Yeah. And, um, and again, each business is different. Some people want to chase every two days, every three days. Someone wants to chase on weekdays only or calendar days. So let emails go out on Saturday and Sunday. Um, another thing we also do with these um, chasing automations is we also move the production and customer due date. So as I understand... Um, <laughs> who's, feeding, like if, who's feeding you all this? <laughs> so you, live in, you, you live in the Printavo API, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, so how is this maintained by the customers? So they just like toggle them on or off on there. And so like once you build it, it's like a dashboard of, you know, a bot or something. And, you know, I want to I want to run this thing now or. Yeah. So the way we set it, set it up is so customers create statuses in Printavo, something like mm -hmm. art approval, chase one, art approval, chase two, art approval, chase three. And then they build an automation inside Printavo saying when status change to Art approval chase one, send this email. If it's changed to status appro uh, art approval chase two, send a different email. Then we on our side is we listen when you change the status to artwork sent for approval. Then we start mm -hmm. an automation on our side. Okay, let's wait three days and in three days check. Has it been approved? No, change status to chase one. Another after mm -hmm. three days, chase two. And then Printavo sends out those emails. Got so it. Because Printavo hasn't built time-based automations, <laughs> or automations, or, uh, <laughs> or these other cool things, or these other these cool like things, advanced you, workflows. It's like like if then if then if then then then, then. it's really cool. And because okay, we've got this foundation integration of Printavo, so we've got customers using it um, for payment chasing. Or um, I know we've got a customer who um, they've got a status uh, order ready for pickup. And so they chase the customer, come over and pick it up. It's ready. Or um, or someone sent a sample out and they want to chase for feedback. So what do you think about the sample? So it's basically all those things where, yes, you can do these manually, but with volume and doing this repetitively, it can become tedious and boring. So um, one of the one of the most viewed videos on Printavo YouTube is uh, my Zap Zap webinar. I'm taking credit for that one. This is old, like really old. I bet you the Zap UI is super. I don't know if you've seen it, Alex, or not. Uh, but Bruce would have me basically, like I was like a circus clown for him, and I would just record my screen of how I was building <laughs> these Zaps. Uh, and it's it's heavily used, and then I get a ton of feedback, like, hey, I can't find this, or I can't do that, or I can't do this. And I spent hours and hours and hours and hours in learning, learning Zapier. What you're telling me is, you know, for a couple hundred bucks a month, I can set up a meeting with you guys, tell you what I want. You go away, build it, come back, and then show us it running. Yes. And on top of that, we'll also ask you, have you thought about this and that? Because we've built automations for multiple Printavo customers. So we can say, oh, by the way, we can also do this and do that. And they're like, that's cool. I want that. And my guess by now is you have the building blocks to reuse and do kind of similar things here, like the, the items you listed, right? Like with the chasing stuff, it's basically mostly around changing status at the correct time. So you have a trigger, uh, Printavo, ask for appro uh, approval sent or order ready to pick up. And then on the back of that, we will start the automations and then change statuses at the correct time. Very cool. And it looks like the price is $99 for, based on the pricing page here, $99 a month. For 10 workflows, that includes 10 workflows, and then any more than that is some sort of custom-based pricing. Is there anything else? Yes, we uh, that includes also 10,000 actions per month. Um, so an action is uh, change status is one action, or check if the order uh, has been approved. Uh, that's another uh, action. Um, I'd say 99% of... Printable customers we have don't go over don't go over the ten thousand limit, uh, so to stay within that ten k. But if people need more, uh, it's only ten dollars per month for an additional ten thousand actions per month. I'm on the Zapier. I just logged into my Zapier account. I'm on the unlimited. I'm on the Pro plan. Fifty thousand tasks uh, a month, and we use the daylights out of it. And we probably get to like thirty five, forty thousand every month, but we're using it for crazy different flows. 
So like 10,000 is a lot. That'll take you a very long way. Um, talk to us. You said something about like Google reviews. That's been a very hot topic in our space. Talk to us about what you do there. So we have an automation to um, ask customers for reviews. So the way we would set it up is you would have a status in Printavo, uh, no order complete, for example. Then we get notified about it. And then we start a timer. Let's send a customer an email in seven days. Hey, can you leave us a Google review on this link? Or can you submit this type form? And, um, and again, yeah, fully automated uh, running in the background. And so a tool like that, so if I were to buy bird's eye out of the box or signpost or one of those tools, those tools are like three, four hundred bucks a month. And that just does Google reviews. We used signpost for several years. It helped us get a ton of reviews. It was super valuable. It was super easy. What's the catch? Because like if I would pay three thousand dollars a year for signpost to do <laughs> reviews, or I could just pay Steven, you to do to do this. I wasn't gonna say that he should raise his prices, but you, I guess you said it. <laughs> Like just that feature alone is worth several thousand dollars a year. <laughs> um, yeah, why, why no, talk to us about that? Uh, no catch. Um, I think we're 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 early stage startup, so we handhold every customer we get. So we do like white glove onboarding. Always jump with them on the calls, uh, phone calls, video calls. Um, so we want to make sure our customers happy. And, and we also learn uh, along the way. So some customers want to um, ask some um, features, some things we haven't done before. Uh, there's a very um, interesting use case we've... Um, so uh, Matt Marcotte uh, has been working with me uh, on these automations. And he said it's one of the most technically challenging ones. Um, it was around... Um, so as I understand, uh, there's a printing company, they do um, bulk orders and they've got a supplier, uh, I think in India. Um, so what they've done, is, so what we've done for them is um, there's a spreadsheet that is shared with the supplier uh, about uh, the orders they've made. Um, and then supplier um, updates the spreadsheet uh, when the goods are ready to be shipped or if there's any delays. So then what we do on our side is we keep checking that spreadsheet. And if let's say Printavo says customer due date is in a month's time, but then the um, supplier abroad puts in the spreadsheet that's actually is going to be ready in two months, we pick that up and send automated email to the customer saying, hey, sorry, your, your order might get delayed. And, and So yeah, like that. So you're listening to even other tools, right? And then you're triggering back into Printavo. Yeah. So we don't only don't only integrate with Printavo. So I don't know if you use a CRM uh, HubSpot, for example. Um, when Alex is working some, on my hub, Alex is working on my HubSpot integration right now with Printavo. We're we're <laughs> testing it this week, actually. So it's almost there. Um, All right. So with Hub, so I'll mention that in a bit. But with HubSpot or any other CRM, so for example. Uh, we just wired up yesterday for a customer is they use Printavo and HubSpot. Uh, so whenever someone submits a quote form on their website, we push that information and create a customer in Printavo if it doesn't already exist. And then we create an order with information from the quote. And then we also go to HubSpot and create a customer there, contact if it doesn't exist, and then add a note saying they requested a um, quote. Here's the details. And what Simon was mentioning with HubSpot, so uh, what we also do now, and we start testing it, um, is for people who use HubSpot, you you go to a contact and you've got that uh, those cards on the right, uh, like with deals, companies. So what we've done is we've built a real-time integration with Printavo. So if you view a contact in HubSpot, you will see their orders from Printavo, what status they're at right now. Uh, is the order paid? What's the outstanding amount, and, and things like that? What automation, Stephen, are you do you have already or want? You know, because like these five that I listed off are awesome for anybody to start using the 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 approval chasing, like the follow up emails, getting reviews, um, sending past emails, HubSpot integration, daily sales. Uh, summary, which I'd love to see a little bit more too, but like, are there others that are you're looking at or connected? 
Um, so we're fortunate enough to have uh, a pretty a pretty tech savvy team. Um, our CTO is a former engineer at Printavo. So there's a lot of stuff he's building in the background because he's a Zap wizard. But then there's a lot of projects that are distracting, if you will, uh, that I think of and I'm like, ah, man, I wish we could just do this or I wish we <laughs> like could what? just do that. Uh, like this HubSpot integration, right? Um, for me to try to spend a ton of time in Zapier to figure it out, there's only so much that I can do, right? And Neil and our engineering team, they're working on other things. And so, you know, what me and Alex will do is we'll just riff on these ideas and say, okay, like, let's take this a step further. And Alex and their team, they understand what the limitations are of Printavo. So we're like, mm, we might not be able to pull that or oof, we're going to have to try and figure out how to do that. But then they they come back with results. Um, and I think that's the coolest part about it all is it's like having like an engineering team on your side that knows enough about the tools that are out there and can tell you very quickly, is this possible or is this impossible? Um, and I think that's that's the coolest part is it's 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 a it's an a la carte uh, version of it. Um, now, Alex, with that being said, can you still use automations.io like by yourself? Like, is there what's the self service part about it? Yeah, so you get full access to the account, and you're free to build your own uh, automations. Uh, and yeah, we we integrate with about forty or fifty different tools. Um, you could use that. Um, then also talking about difference to Zapier. Uh, so one of our unique features is um, we have a concept of human tasks. Um, so we don't have Printavo customers using that yet. Um, but to give you an idea of it is that if you think about, for example, Zapier or, or the automations we talked about before, they're fully automated, hands-free automations. They run in the background. You don't touch them. But what we can do is we can build interactive um, automations where there's human involvement. So an automation can run and do some things automatically, but then somewhere in the middle, it create a task for a person to do something. It could be like, oh, do you approve this? Or can you fill out so, some details in this form? And then they complete the task. And then depending on the outcome, the automation will take different paths. Um, Interesting. It's kind of like a stop sign in your middle of auto your automation. So like an example that I'm thinking of right now is we're trying to track expenses um, in real time as much as we possibly can. And so we process an order, the purchaser goes ahead and orders it, and then it hits a certain spreadsheet, right? We want someone to manually go in and figure out exactly what we spent on those. Now today we can't automatically do that. It's a little too complicated, but it only takes a couple minutes per job. So in that instance, a stop sign would hit and it would say, Hey, uh, go ahead and enter in this value now. And then once that value is entered, maybe it goes to another chart that's going to show me how much I'm spending at SNS every day or whatever that might be, right? And so that's how you could build a gross profit. A, you could build a contribution margin tracker, if you will, if you really wanted to to do something. Mm. Is that that's what you mean by like human interaction? Yeah, that's a, that's a good example. And for for example, with expenses, so let's say <laughs> let's let's say you've got a policy. We ought to approve all expenses under, I don't know, hundred dollars, and over that we need manual approval. So we'll build an automation uh, expense um, request received. If amount is less than hundred, approve. If not approved, create a task for a manager or someone to review the um, uh, expense, click approve or reject, and then depending on the outcome, we'll go and update. Send an email to the person saying, "Sorry, we." not approved or provide more details, et cetera. All right. So <laughs> where, how, how do people get started and uh, sign up? It's automations.io. Do you click get a demo and, and then you, you know, you sync up with an account manager and start rolling? Yeah. So go to our website, um, click get a demo, book a call. Um, so we'll jump on a call. Uh, usually it's like 10, 15 minute call. Uh, to understand what you're after. And then you create a free, so we do a free trial account. You use it for free for seven days. Um, and after seven days, if you're happy, you enter your credit cards. If not, no hard feelings. Alex, for what you're charging, I understand that you're charging a very fair rate. <laughs> uh, and you're in an early start of part of your business. But at what point 
you know, let's just take um, our good friend, Scott, Scott Garnett. Scott's going to be listening to it. We love Scott. Scott's going to think of a million and one things. And at a certain point, you're going to be like, dude, Scott, I'm working with you for like three hours a week. This isn't worth a hundred bucks. Why are you so white glove right now in the stage of your business? Because I think that's really, really interesting as an entrepreneur of how how white glove you are with 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 these customers. Well, so very recently we started uh, charging people um, some setup fees when some of the things they ask for become very complex and it takes a lot of time to build. Um, so there will be potentially some setup fees involved. Uh, but before that, um, we just wanted to get customers. Uh, we want to speak with customers. We want to hear what they want and how they feel about the things we build. And yeah, we just wanted to get as much customers as possible and make everyone happy um, while we're building and iterating the product. Uh, because we're adding tons of new integrations, tons of new features like the human tasks I mentioned. Um, the end goal with Automations IO, uh, like one of the, my visions is, is for it to become like your operations hub of what's going on in your business. So all these things happen in your business. There's, uh, you can, I don't know, track your expense requests and what's happening with them. You can track your orders. You can see metrics. Um, so it's just basically like a, um, operations hub uh, for your business where um, some things are automated running the background, but some things require manual um, intervention. Bruce, can you talk to us about early on at Printavo, what you were like when you were getting your first couple hundred customers? What was that? Because this is very, I'm, I'm seeing like a lot of similarities. And I think shops as business owners that are just starting out can think about how you cater to your early adopters, if you will. Um, Bruce, can you talk about early Printavo and how you and like it wasn't about money, it wasn't about it was free trials. It, like, can you tell us about that early on? Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the pricing changing um, and and adding value, which is interesting. So, I spent a lot of time, kind of similar to you, Alex, in the t-shirt forums. Um, Farrakh, were you around when there's uh, t-shirt forums dot com? Uh, I think I, I emailed you in like 2014. So. Maybe that was Might like have been the a end of yeah. I think forms. Facebook RIP was yeah, to, uh, yeah. To to them to the Facebook groups, but um, spent a lot of time in there asking for feedback. Same exact thing. Hey, I, I, we've got this offering. We're trying to work on this. We're trying to build a better product here. How do we, um, uh, you know, sign up? Give us your email for when you're interested. And so we, I remember we got eighty something um, interest. Then I was ready to release it, right? I sent it out. I, I emailed everybody from this list. I think this was 2012, early 2012, late 2011. Emailed everyone. I was like, wow, they're going to come in. They're going to start paying. I, I had, I think it had it at 29 a month. Um, I'm sure some people listening may have had that plan, you know, until we adjusted. You're going to get egged. Someone's going to egg the computer <laughs> yeah. right now. So it was 29 a month and I emailed everybody. And guess how many people responded? Zero. <laughs> Zero. Zero people were interested. They, they didn't want to even really talk. So it's awesome that you've got started and get this flow out. So... Zero people responded. So I'm like, what the heck is the pricing off? Like what, you know, and obviously you release something, you got to keep, you got to keep pushing it, but you know, you spend so much time, you think you hit the pinnacle, you built the product. The Bruce, offering. how long were you building before you launched this? <sighs> A year, maybe two, somewhere in between there. It's quite some time of, of uh, like getting something going. I mean, anybody who's building their own custom integrations and stuff is just like, not only is it never done, but it's just like this constant climb up. <laughs> so it's not even like, I feel like that you necessarily plateau in, in a product. It's like you're always wanting more stuff or it's breaking or it's slowing down or whatever. But anyway, um, so then um, I, I say, okay, it's the price. That's the problem. So I lower the price. It's free now. We're going to figure it out. We're going to be like, you know, these other companies who, who sell ads. Maybe, maybe we'll have ads pop up on your calendar. You'll see like Uber Eats, <laughs> a 30 second Uber Eats ad before you have to log in. And uh, so I post again on the forum and say, all right, guys, um, just want to get your feedback. We, we lower the price to free. Want to get your thoughts. And I remember I jumped on a call with someone. And they're like, well, 
if I'm going to try to run part of my business with you guys, like, how are you going to be around for a long time? Uh, what do you get? Like, or how are you going to make money? And I was like, well, that's kind of nice of you to ask. I mean, I guess we'll figure it out. And he's like, yeah, it's kind of risky on my end. Um, and then I heard literally almost the same conversation again a couple of days later. So raised it back up. I was like, you know, what do you want? And so anyway, raised it back up. I think it was back up at 30 bucks again. And then eventually just keep posting, keep sharing, keep promoting. And then we had, I remember the first person paying, it was $19, I think because there was a coupon code or something. I got that Stripe email. And um, yeah, that was the beginning. But same as you, Alex, it was just staying super close to the customer. It was always listening, hopping on calls, doing demos, getting you know customer service and iterating as quick as possible. But yeah. Bruce, who, who was that first? Do you know? Do you know? You know... I'd have to go back through my email. I'm sure I could find it. Is it Miles? Um, first, he was one of the first few uh, Miles t-shirts out of Springfield. He was definitely one of the first few. And am I right, Bruce, that you've boots, bootstrapped as well at the, mm-hmm. at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so we're doing the same thing as well. Um, can I, can I, I'm going to just like 180 this conversation. I want to get your guys' opinions because we got like, we got three tech forward people on here. This is unique and um, who are in this industry. So, uh, Apple Vision Pros, right? Uh, I think you've seen, everyone's seen them. They've seen the memes. Maybe you've watched a review video or whatever. Um, Steven, maybe you at first, like what were your thoughts and were there anything related to your shop as far as this could be used or there's something here or is it just total toy? Bruce, first of all, we have to ask a, we have to ask a question. Have you ordered one? No. I, okay. four, what is it? 3,500, 3,600. Did you, Alex, did you order one? I, I can do just us only. I think they're going to uh, be in the UK later this year. I early on got a set of VR goggles. I don't know, whatever they were called. And I think I used them twice and put them down and never used them again. And my business partner's grandson has them now. Which ones? Wait, the, uh, the glasses? Quests. No, like this is like, Oh, uh, I don't know. This is like early, early Facebook's on. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, four or five years ago. And then I've, you know, I don't think I've put on a pair since. <laughs> um, but when I watch it, I'm like, wait a second. They're literally just like working on their computer and then they're like out in space. Um, you look like total dweebs. Um, I don't know. I think it's going to be mostly for entertainment and gaming. I don't, I just don't see it. You don't see it. Like, now, I don't the, s- the difference between these, though, and the Facebook ones are these augment reality versus the Facebook ones are just pure you're in virtual reality, right? Like these are like looking through sunglasses and it applies a layer on top of reality. Well, no, they I mean, Zuckerberg just came out yesterday and said there's the see through thing on one of the Facebook ones. Um, oh, yeah. He literally they're, did they're a, trying AR he, AR stuff as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so it's weird. You're looking at a screen, but you're looking out of your window. It's like you're in your own little rocket ship or something like that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. The, I, I, I don't know. Alex, what do you think? <laughs> well, I watched a few interviews first. Uh, so some of the tech interviews where they reviewed in the studio. And then I watched, uh, is it uh, Casey Neistat, I think? Um, yeah where he wore it for 12 hours in New York. And then he has this part in the video where he sits in Times Square and he's got like five windows in front of him. There's YouTube, there's something else here, there's something else here. And and I agree with Steven. I think this this is more, right now this is more of an entertainment device. And I think this could be potential the future of entertainment because right now, yeah, the big ski goggles, but think 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, 30, they could be a size size of just normal glasses. And then you'll see people on uh, trains, instead of sitting in there looking down, sitting, uh, watching at the phones, they'll look somewhere with their glasses on and they'll have like three, uh, three big screens watching three films or three football games at the same time. That's a good point. The technology is still early. I actually, um, I have the Ray-Ban meta glasses. I got them as a gift. Um, and actually, uh, we were out in Salt Lake city and we went dog sledding and I used them for it and it was super cool. 
Um, so that was my one use case of using them that I thought that was <laughs> Bruce. You saw well, the video stay pretty, out of the jar. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the videos, so that was pretty cool. That awesome. was pretty tight, but yeah, I, I think it's early. I don't know, Bruce, do you think let me, let me show you this in- video real quick? So here, here's this video I saw on Twitter. This is it for people listening to the audio. This is someone playing the piano. They're wearing the vision pros and there's this app that helps you learn to play the piano. And so you're looking at the piano through the goggles and it's telling you what key to push to play this song. So it's kind of training you to learn how to play the piano in this maybe new school way. I don't, I don't know if it works better than learning sheet music. It's like Guitar not, Hero. But, yes. It's literally like a VR kind of Guitar Hero, real life version of this. My thinking was, you know, does this correlate to... um does this correlate to training someone how to do something in the real world as well? Like could my, my brother's a doctor and I'm thinking like, Whoa, like, is this, is this in like some sort of surgery thing or something where they're actually showing you what to to look for or what to pull out or the tool to grab or something? Could that be in production somehow Um, with operating a press, you know, someone who's never done it before, but they put these things on and it's like, push this button to turn it on, you know, push this button to just squeegee, push it, you know, and uh, be able to get people ramped up sooner. Cause everyone knows they don't like trading a, a team member. No one blocks off the time. No one invests enough time. Does this take it off your plate? Yeah, and it is. I think it, it's um, also talking about, uh, you're talking about medical use cases. I know, I think as Boeing or Airbus are using, engineers are using AR headsets um, when they're inside the plane to look through the wall where the cables are because planes got like miles of cables. And instead of looking at the manual where they are, they just put on the headsets and they can see through the walls where the, where the cables are. So that's pretty cool use case. Um, I know doctors, I think, use it um, so when they would look at something in 3D where I don't know where you have to cut or something, um, things like that. And and uh, the video I'm showing on um, on X is um, I saw another one. I think there's one below is very cool use case with accessibility. So if you cannot hear, uh, you put the goggles on, you could see subtitles of what the person is saying, like a speech bubble and just real life text what what they're saying, or also, if they speak a different language, it also translates real time. So you can have like a normal mm-hmm. conversation hmm. with a person. That's kind of cool. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. I think uh, when companies like this, whether it's Meta or Android or Apple, they put these out, they don't know what inventions and innovation are going to happen, right? Like that's almost like when the iPhone came out, we didn't know what the App Store was going to be. And then once right. the App Store was out, developers were able to invent and wander and figure things out there. So you know, would I like it if I could control my press from a VR? Like, could I technically control a robot that's loading shirts um, <laughs> from a room? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, could that be, you know, like for surgeons, they have what it's called the Da Vinci, where they can actually be working on something else. And it's actually orthoscopically doing the surgery somewhere else. So, I mean, it's only up from here. Uh, it's just going to be it's going to be interesting what what moves it makes and what routes it takes. It'll be interesting if it's going to help more from the accessibility in the medical field or like manufacturing, how's it going to affect manufacturing? What's your opinion there, Bruce? It's, a, it, it's always interesting. Like for example, you know, we're working through the whole receiving, you know, purchasing improvements in Printavo. And when you go into a shop, a lot of people just record it on paper. Right. Um, and paper is very fast. You get a highlighter and a pen, maybe, you know, the highlighter is like something's missing and you highlight it and the pen is you check it off and move on. <clears throat> like where does, where do computers sort of help and then also hinder, right? Cause if something is just really quick on paper, I think people are just going to naturally continue gravitating towards printing something out unless there's some sort of benefit and it's comparable to the the pain of doing it on paper, like in in a computer. So, like for the training example, right now, well, like what do people do for you guys? Is it like just shadowing, or you know, they're just following over the current operator, and the current operator is training the new person? That's probably pretty easy to do, right? Um, there there may be very little actual real world circumstances where there's nobody to shadow the next person, and that you need the goggles for that. Um, 
but I do think about some of the things like that made lab is doing right. Uh, for example, you know, uh, learning about water-based printing or learning about, um, uh, automation on, on going from manual to an automatic press. I mean, could some of those things be used with the headset or done at home with the headset or maybe reinforced at home later with the headset? Yeah, that could be, that could be pretty cool. And I'd love to see, I think the, the people who have the most influence are the press manufacturers here with something of new like this. Like imagine if they just spend a month hiring an engineering team, taking their internal engineering team, say, hey guys, look, build something, it could be janky, whatever, but what you guys think would be helpful on this headset, I don't know. I, I think that could be really cool. Take a little bit it, of money from the, t- yeah, from the digital but side. We're, we're to starting to side. see more like camera capture recording on presses. I think MNR had it at the trade show where there's a camera that sits on top of the press and it'll check each print as it's coming off. Mm, like right. computer vision, sure. Yeah, it's like computer vision stuff. So I think we need to get through computer vision first before we get to augmented reality. So maybe the industry might be a, might be a little interesting to see when it when it when it hits the space. On the other side, uh, one of the things you could potentially do is for art approvals, instead of just sending an image, click here, approve, reject. You send them a, like a three D model, then they put the goggles on, and they can see themselves in the mirror trying this hoodie on or a t-shirt with a logo, different colors, and just approve, reject, or try different colors and things like that. There's a company doing that um, in the fashion space in our uh, Hampton business group, actually, Stephen, that's trying to build that so it's ultra realistic. And the goal is to help returns for retail Hmm. businesses. It's some astronomical number. (laughs) It's like the average amount of returns that a retail business deals with. But... Yeah, I love it. All right. I just shared this link in the chat group. Uh, so this guy, Jason Cohen, he writes a blog called A Smart Bear. Um, I think just a really great short reads for, for business owners. This one I thought was interesting. So I want to get your guys a quick take and just talk about it before we close out. So they talk about brainstorming, right? And that how brainstorming can usually be a, an, like an endless, maybe even waste of time. A lot of times, especially if you have too many people in there or, you know, you end up going off the deep end or whatever it is. But Jason here listed a bunch of different prompts to help you sort of jostle your brain and rethink what we view as what we've been doing for the past X amount of years, right? Generally speaking, as the business continues to grow, you create processes, you create routines, you have people that are used to these routines, and it's hard to really get out of that to really innovate. And Stephen, you brought this up before, is sometimes you may need to cannibalize yourself. I think that was a great example with, is it Kodak? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so there's just a couple that I want to bring up that I love thinking about. Number one, he said, what if you 10X your price? What if you were forced to increase your prices by 10X? What would you have to do to justify it today? For example, like what would your brand look like? Uh, what would the positioning look like? Um, would the subset of your target market have to change? And so on. I, I thought that was interesting. Like, for example, at Campus Inc., if you had the 10X everything, I mean, if it we really had to sell a your three hundred, if we had to sell a three or four hundred dollar shirt, that would have to be the world's best shirt and the world's best experience and the world's best collectible. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to think about the T-shirt completely different. Like it was something you had to have and it was rare and you know scarce, and somehow you're able to sell it. Um, it would no longer be a T-shirt, right? Yeah, it would be something. And completely to this point, different. I think like the. The target market may change, but especially releasing new products, I think, in the market, like, or maybe add on products or add on services, it is interesting. Like, what if we were 2x? It doesn't have to be 10. What if we were 2x the cost generally? Um, how would you think about it? The other one that I really liked is what if there was no support? And the reason why I bring this up is because Shopify, I feel like, is such a crazy powerful platform but you can literally sign up and get your store live in a couple hours, right? I mean, it's such a deep feature rich um, tool, but you only see the top layer to help get you started right away. So if you had no sort of success manager or account manager to help push something through and someone was just there to do it on their own and can do it as quickly as possible, 
how would the business look like? What would this product look like? How would this service be offered? You know, how would we market it? Things like that. I think for us, we, we could 10x the price. And I, I was actually I was, uh, given advice. So you, so you mentioned about us uh, potentially raising prices because we undercharge. And I was giving advice in the SaaS world is like double your price every X months. And until like, I don't know, 50% of people say no because it's too expensive. That's like, that's a sweet spot. Um, it's not 50% exactly, but that's the idea. Keep raising prices until you get massive pushback. It's too expensive. Once you and get pushed so back, yeah, we, you know, you, yeah. Once you get pushed back, you know, you're priced perfectly. But with support on our side, we can't not do support because uh, when people start using us, we become critical to their operations and business success. So if things stop working, they lose money, they lose revenue, customers, et cetera. No, I was going to say like, if ordering t-shirts had to be 100% self-service, what would Campus Inc. look like? If you couldn't email someone to order and you had to go online and purchase it, right? Like, what would that look like? Um, Custom Inc. Uh, <laughs> another company, right? Other companies with crazy, crazy tech stacks. But yeah, it's it's interesting to wander and think about that. Uh, I liked... Bruce, I was going to ask, which, which, what's the last one on the list that you were going to bring up? <clears throat> the last one I think you'd really like is what if you had no time? Because I, I know you like to like push and like, like, why aren't we doing this today versus tomorrow? What if you were forced to ship, uh, uh, you know, a version of what you want to be able to do a new feature or an MVP of a service or a new offering in just two weeks that would delight and surprise even just a small piece of your customers? Like what, what would, what would those steps be? And like, how would that change? And how would that push the structure and, and, and team? Would I have more printable features that I want? <laughs> Maybe. I like, there's a saying that, um, when you launch and if you're not embarrassed about your product or features, it means you launch too late. You need to launch sooner. That's uh Reed Hoffman. I think the founder of LinkedIn says that. Um, yeah. yeah, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late. Bruce, I thought you were going to bring up the one that said sociopath CEO. No, that wasn't, that was, no, that oh, was not okay. that one. Okay. That's your gotcha. favorite one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but like, yeah, if you had no time, right. If everything was just ship, 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 ship. Right. Um, sometimes I get frustrated as our company grows. We, there's times where we move fast. There's times where we go slow. And I'll say, it doesn't take 10 people to screw in a light bulb. Someone just freaking do it, you know? And I think that's that like agility that really swift companies have is they just know how to ship. Um, like mm -hmm. Shopify just released a hundred new features for the year. Did you guys see that? Yeah. It's so cool how they, they do these releases like two, two times a year. How, how, when is this? Uh, I think, I mean, I just read it on, on, on the holidays, but like, I wonder how quick, how agile their teams are. And I wonder how how much they figure it out after they launch. Like, hey, just get it live and we'll figure out as it breaks. Yeah. I don't know. It's kind of like the, how they just do the testing of it. I, I mean, there's just so many questions there. Just just sell it and the, we'll figure out how to print it. And I know in the tech world, uh, so Amazon Web Services, the Amazon's uh, cloud infrastructure part. Um, so uh, Amazon's famous for their two pizza teams. Um, and AWS, Amazon Web Services, has a conference yearly reinvent where they announce new products and services. And sometimes they would announce products before they even started building them. So they'll announce, oh, we're bringing out this new feature and um, they'll just start working on it after announcing it and listening what customers are saying about it. How's the, is it what the customers want or not, what features they want, et cetera. So... So Bruce, when you how to do it. Bruce, when you used to do that, would that stress out your team? Um yeah. Yeah, it would. <clears throat> but there I think there is a gray area of how to manage the feeling of urgency um versus complacency. And it's like there's not one or the other, but it's definitely a balance. Um yeah, I don't know if I've perfected it, but you know, if, if you lose all sense of urgency, there's just things float. I mean, they, they'll float forever. There's just no sense of getting it done today versus next week. But if you're constantly like that, um, I mean, you, you definitely create an environment which only certain people will want to stay. 
and maybe that's okay. Like maybe that's okay. I guess it depends on the type of business you're you're setting up. I, like have you have you thought about that, Stephen? Of uh, how how you do that in campus? Because you 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 obviously you know you're pushing new stuff. You did the this Purdue pop up I saw online. Like I'm sure that you know. Um, not out of left field, but you know, oh, it was out of left wasn't field. the regular stuff that you guys are doing. Um, the reputation that I have at Campus Inc. is you might wake up and there might be something new that's launching. That's pretty common. And I will push people out of their comfort zone. For me, the thrill is figuring it out as you go. That's a thrill for me. Mm-hmm. We're just going to figure it out. We're going to figure it out. And for other people, it can stress them out a ton. But as a company that's growing, we're trying to grow at a pretty fast pace. We're trying to innovate at a pretty fast pace. Sometimes I have to gamble and roll the dice and say, hit the press. We're doing this. Send it out. We're going. When I, when I force the team to do that, you know, for instance, we have a new program where we are putting heat presses in retail stores to allow fans to customize their merch on demand. Um, so we're basically sending transfers, blanks, kiosks, all that stuff. And uh, we took it to a trade show. And my team's like, how are we going? I have so many questions. I'm like, don't worry about that. Just sell it. Um, and what's cool is when we got back, we sold it. We did really well with it. And now every week we have you know the next four to five months to develop it. If I didn't have the... Um, kind of the the gambling kind of mentality, that risk-taking mentality, just kind of push it out in the universe, we could spend four months trying to perfect it before ever launching it. So I'm of the camp that you should launch as early as you possibly can. And when you put it out in space, it puts more pressure on you to either figure it out or not figure it out, right? Um, it's like good pressure. Yeah. I don't know. I like it. Yeah, I'd agree with that because... Uh, like I've been guilty of that in the past, especially since I'm a tech person, is you'll start building something and you try to perfect it, or you might build something that none of your customers even ask for it, but you think it's a cool idea. And then you could spend weeks and months uh, uh, doing that. So then you have to just take a step back and um, also think like, did anyone ask for this? Do customers want this or not? Um, uh, but from other point of view is, yeah, like Steven said, um, I, I like this way of we're doing this and we'll figure it uh, along the way. Um, and that a bit of a little bit of that stress also, I think, changes how you think uh, when you're under pressure. And I think you might get better outcomes as well. Agree. Alex at automations.io. We appreciate you being able to join us. Sign up. Give it a try. I mean, this this, this seems awesome. Matt marcott has been raving about it as well. And uh, print hustlers, you guys have been joining us every single week. Don't forget to subscribe. That uh, makes us feel good. All right, guys. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Thanks. Bye. Thanks so much for listening. Hopefully that was informative. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like. Don't forget to hit the bell for notifications. If you enjoyed this video, if you enjoy all the stuff we're putting out, it's really helpful. We love to just be able to see it. That means that we're doing a good job. To subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, and hit the like button. And I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.